All right, guys, we are going to get started here. We have we have a good amount of people on this call. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the 2020 annual business meeting. Uh, as a reminder, if you guys can please keep your phones on mute if you're not speaking. Uh, we're all happy to, that you're all able to join us to, uh, during this unprecedented time for our meeting. Uh, usually right now we'd be uh, hosting our AEM, uh, but for obvious reasons, we can't be going into that right now. You should all be able to see my screen if you are uh, on the computer system. So usually at this time of the year, we would be hosting our annual education meeting. However, because of COVID, uh, that was impossible for this year. Uh, but we are busy getting ready for our 2021 AEM, which will be held at the Hutchinson Shores Resort and Spa on August 1st to August 7th of 2021. Uh, we hope you're all available to join us for this AEM, and we're going to work really hard to make it. Uh, so it's a real fun AEM. It's one of the best ones we ever had. Uh, so we have over a year to plan it right now. Uh, so we're real excited that it's all set up already. Uh, Hutchinson Shores is a beautiful resort, uh, and we were all ready to go there this year, but we just had to postpone it for uh, one more year. So we're going to talk more about what FIA has in store for our members during our member meeting, which is going to be right after the upcoming presentations. Uh, we invite all FIA members and guests to stay for our member meeting uh, after the presentations. During this part of our meeting, we'll be announcing our new uh, 2020 to 2021 Board of Directors. Directly following the member meeting, we'll be having our annual board meeting. Any active FIHA member is welcome to join us for the board meeting. Uh, if you're not current on your FIHA membership, uh, right now is a great time to renew, and then you can come and enjoy our board meeting as well. Uh, some general housekeeping rules, if you can please mute uh, your computers and phones during the presentation. Uh, if you do have any questions, uh, if you're on the computer, there's little uh, bubbles on the top middle of your screen. One of them is a chat window. If you open up that chat window, you can type any messages into there, and we'll address all questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you need a certificate of attendance for the webinar, um, there'll be instructions at the end of the second uh, presentation uh, to, get, uh, to get yourself a certificate of attendance so you can claim your contact. Uh, our first guest speaker uh, is Amanda Thronson. Uh, Amanda currently works for the Florida Department of Health in Tallahassee as the State Safe Kids Florida Coordinator in the Violence and Injury Prevention Section. She began working for the Department of Health in April 2019 on the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission's Pool Safety Grant uh, full-time in promotion in January 2020. The Pool Safety Grant was awarded uh, to the state to combat unintentional drownings through education of those statute enforcement personnel and community outreach. Ms. Thronson has been in the aquatics industry for more than 20 years, teaching, training, running programs and facilities. She holds training certifications from the American Red Cross, along with being a certified pool operator and achieving her master's degree. She'll be talking with us today about the occurrence of drowning incidents in Florida in 2020. Uh, Amanda, uh, thank you very much for being here today. And with that, I'm going to pass uh, the presenter role over to Amanda. Uh, are you on the call, Amanda? I am. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Awesome. I am running two computers because the work computer does not like this program. <laughs> so, um, so part of what the violence and injury prevention section works on um, are quite a few injury prevention topics, and one of the most relevant for Florida is drowning prevention, um, especially children five and under. Um, and the pandemic has not really helped us much um, combating those efforts. Um, so I'm going to go over, um, if you'll flip to the next slide, um, a little bit about open water safety, because that seems to be the main issue currently going on. The next slide, please. So this is what drowning looks like. Um, most people that are having issues in the water are trying to get air. 
the head is tilted back. They're facing towards the shore and or, oops, one too many. Can you go back just one slide, please? Thank you. Um, so this is what it looks like, facing towards the shore, heads back, they're trying to climb. Um, those of you that can swim well know that this doesn't get you very far, does not help you keep your head up, um, and it barely helps you get any air. Uh, these are, this is what to look for, especially if you're out with your family and your kids um, and you're watching them. Uh, adults as well. Uh, we have a higher incident of adult drownings in the state of Florida than we do children. Um, there's about 75% of the total drownings are adults in this state. If you'll switch to the next slide, please. So, just from this year and just from the Army Corps of Engineers um, waterfront property, more than 30 people have lost their lives to drowning in 2020 or June of 2020. Um, that was a 47% increase, uh, and that was just for one month. Uh, nearly all of the drownings, as everyone can see, were adult males ages 18 to 85, and majority were not wearing a life jacket. Um, many times when you're going out into open water, everybody's like, oh, I've got the skills I need. Um, I can do this. I don't need a life jacket. Just bring the life jackets just in case. Uh, they are a lifesaver and they um, are useful, uh, especially when you're out boating. If you'll switch to the next slide, please. Um, so some of the open water safety um, that I took away from a webinar recently um, was that novices really need to know the differences between pool and open water. Um, a lot of you on this call deal with pools on a daily basis, um, and you can tell the difference between pools and open water as pools are contained, and open water is usually massive. Um, not all the time, but a lot of times you're not gonna be able to see uh, what is on the bottom of the open water. So the other big thing is distances are not understood. And this is something I didn't even think about until I saw this presentation. And it, if your eyes are at water level, the horizon is 800 meters away. Not many people can swim a continuous 800 meters to keep going. Um, in open water, you should be a good swimmer, strong swimmer. Um, you should have a life jacket, should wear it if you're not a strong swimmer, um, and realize what experiences you have in open water. Um, and then everyone seems to underestimate the um, what cold water does to the body. So cold water is anything 70, 70 degrees or below. Granted, our waters around the state of Florida don't get that cold until January-ish, if that. Um, however, some of the lakes and um, the springs are quite cold. Um, so boating safety. Most common mishaps are leaving because somebody left the boat. And there is a four in 10 chance of never being found again if you're out in open water, um, especially if you are not wearing a life jacket. Uh, life jackets do save lives. They keep you afloat. They let you rest. They don't make you swim. You don't have to swim with them on. You can, but you don't have to. Um, so just a couple tips. When you're going out in open water, make sure you bring your life jacket, make sure you have a floating plan, make sure you tell people, um, and don't just leave the boat to leave the boat. Next slide, please. So here are the current total for from 2016 to uh, provisional data from Florida charts. As you can see, we are more than halfway of what we were 
as of last year. This um, as of last year, um, last year's totals were 388 residents that drown, um, and a total of 478 throughout the entire state. Um, and those all include all the non-residents. And we are already at 226 as of July 31st, August 1st. Next slide, please. And part of what I was looking at when I was pulling data was the children's numbers, um, just because that is a big focus of where I'm at and a big focus of what the State Health Improvement Plan has been looking at. And so far this year, we are up to 56 um, children that have died from drowning uh, that were residents, uh, 60 total. Um, and Florida charts, from what I, under, uh, what I was told, was it updates every Sunday. Um, and then next year, all of the numbers will be certified that these are all correct. So 56 is quite a bit. Um, we are 30 off, uh, less, less, less than 30 off of where we were last year for a total. Um, and as you can see, each year the numbers have been going down with the exception of 2018. Um, and that was uh, where the state picked up the, uh, the consumer safety grant and work began in 2019 to for more of a push on water safety throughout the state. Next slide, please. And I pulled sources, um, I pulled three different data sources um, just so that you can get an idea that not all data sources are all encompassing. Uh, they give you a general idea of what is currently going on. And as of August 1st, 2020, for the US, we've had about 1,300 drowning deaths. Um, and as you see in the slides, it changes over the month. And um, just so you can compare 2020 to 2019, some months are better than others, <laughs> some months were not. In March is when all of the stay-at-home orders started, and in May is when they were relaxed. Uh, as you notice, in May of this year, they went up slightly. Um, and as, and oops, sorry, in June they went up slightly, and in July they went back down. Um, and then for Florida, we've had about 72 drowning deaths, and most of them have been in open water. Um, most of them have not been in pools, with the exception of the children. And last year, this time, there were 99, about 99 deaths um, for Florida. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, child fatalities, 2019 versus 2020. In column two, it's the number total number of deaths in column three is the ages of the child um, that, that um, died due to drowning. March of this year, again, stay-at-home orders started. Um, in May, they were relaxed. Um, as you notice in May, the numbers for children went up. Um, and these are not all inclusive numbers. Some of this data, um, all of this comes from the Department of Children and Families, and some of the data is restricted at the moment and is not available due to um, current proceedings going on. So this is what they've been able to publish and clear. As you notice, majority of them are under the age of five, around the one, two, and three age. Um, many of the stories and the reports that were um, written on these were the child got away from the adult, there was unrestricted access to water, um, and the child did not know how to swim. Next slide, please.
So real time data. Um, one of the counties that I am working with, um, thank you, Pinellas County Department of Health, um, uses real time EMS data um, and has access to first watch um, EMS tracking system and was able to share with me data from January of this year till July of this year. Um, Obtaining the EMS data is often a challenge. Not every county runs the same program, um, and not every county uh, will allow access to um, the data. And there are discrepancies between each of the agencies when using data because one may have counted one as a drowning and one may have counted it as a heart attack in the water. Um, so based on all of the allowable information that isn't suppressed, uh, Gaining this data, if you can get it, is great. Um, and it may change over and evolve as it's made available. Um, not everywhere is it available. And I, my task I lately have been trying to figure out which county use which system um, so I can share that with uh, many of the other organizations that I work with um, for drowning prevention. So some of the benefits are to create, it creates a narrative. Um, and you'll see on the next couple pages, the data that was given to me uh, has a story behind it. And it'll identify in areas where there's high incidence. If you will switch to the next page, and then I'm gonna say something really quick and then just switch to the, the following one after that. So the children's data for Pinellas County um, has a lot more information, but this is the pertinent information. The date, the time, the city, the location, the age, um, the sex of the child, notes, um, the final outcome, and if CPR was performed other than EMS. And you can switch to the next one. Many of these, um, in charts, you don't get this information. So the notes were, the child went missing, child was then found in the lake. Um, as you see, the dad was in the pool, the child fell in head first, was under for three seconds. Um, some of these calls probably did not need to happen. And then others were definitely a call and were um, lucky that there was somebody that could perform CPR um, on site. So, um, so this one right here where it says 614, um, was, uh, the four-year-old male was found in the pool by mom unconscious um, after CPR became conscious. So it's a good thing mom knew CPR. Again, it usually has to do with kids getting away from the adults, which kids are really great at doing, and then finding access to the water because that's where they wanted to go and there was a toy in there. And they get into the water and realize really quickly that they don't know how to get out of the water. The next slide, please. So here's a comparison side by side for Pinellas County for the number of submersions for the county for the last five years um, up until the end of June. And while these don't seem like it's a lot, this is just one county out of 67. So if I were to pull everybody's information and put it side by side, it would then show you those full numbers that you saw from the charts page. Next, next two slides. And so I didn't realize this, but it was pointed out to me um, that, um, and, and, and it might just be in certain parts of the state. However, there have been several attempts to use drowning as a means of suicide. Um, there were four reported for Pinellas County for adults um, trying to use drowning to um, commit suicide is a very difficult thing to do because your natural body's response is to get air. Um, and as you see, there's a couple of them and I will, um, there were four that were pointed out to me and all four were um, unsuccessful and transported. However, 
if you read some of the adult ones here, a lot of them have to do with health and having a seizure or a heart attack or cardiac arrest in the water. Um, when that happens, you really need to make sure that you are not swimming alone first and you, somebody is there that can help you pull you out and perform CPR. Um, again, it gives you a better picture of what is going on for drowning for the county and submersions for the county. Next slide, please. So some of the factors to the increase, which I have, um, and, and this is all based on information that I have been collecting and reading and researching, um, COVID and the pandemic um, safety measures were implemented, implemented in March. Normally, children are in school and supervised, they're not running around the house, they're not interrupting during work hours, um, many adults had to go home and then do work from home. Uh, work, have child supervision, uh, teach school, uh, add on all the um, other things that one has to do while at home as an adult with children. Um, and normally in March is when children in Florida begin swim lessons and those didn't start. Um, organizations used to host safety events and trainings. Some organizations were able to do digital trainings, but nobody was able to go and present to the children at school. No one was able to go and present to parents um, on the weekends at events. And so a lot of that starts adding up to, we're forgetting about water safety um, altogether. So March, April, May trends show numbers going up and overall trends for child related drownings were about the same for 2019. We are slightly above for this year, uh, and if you will click on the link, the short video, um, one of many news clips that I found that are pertinent to <clears throat> what is going on and what to look for. What happened? Oh no, there's no sound either. And it worked yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> it's technology and it's Friday. So and there's no sound. Hey, Michael, if there's no sound, we'll just move ahead. For a child to drown. Shocking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very shocking because it doesn't take much. And one of the best things you can do to prevent a drowning, whether it's in a wave pool or a larger pool, is to designate someone as a water watcher. That's a person who's not going to be distracted by a phone or anything else who hasn't had any alcohol, and they have one job and one job only, to watch the water at all times for 15 minutes, and then that job would rotate to another responsible adult. Now If you just want to switch to the next slide, that works. It's not, uh, um, and if you want to send out these slides at the end, that's great because then everybody else can click on the links and listen to it. Um, it was just discussing um, one of the parents um, that has lost a child was discussing the dangers of 
swimming pools and putting up kiddie pools in the yard and leaving them there full and walking away from them. Um, so when everyone gets a chance to click on the link themselves, um, you're more than welcome to do so. We will move on to the next one. Some other factors to um, the increase were besides distractions and unrestricted access to um, water, um, the telecommuting, the teaching school, the household activities, um, doors have been left unlocked and barriers not secured. And then parents were leaving older children in charge of watching younger children. Um, those of you that have older children that have no interest in their siblings understand that the older children don't always pay attention as much as you pay attention to them. So um, above ground kiddie pool, above ground and kiddie pool materials climbed starting in March, and many of those people that purchased those did not put fencing around anywhere or put them up um, and are leaving them filled in the yard. So in May, and in June and July, uh, we started to see a decrease. Uh, in May and June, the Pool Safely Grant uh, sponsored PSAs to be uh, played on TV, radio, and social media throughout the state. Uh, the most popular one was the Water Watcher. And if you will play that video for me, which is the one I got uh, set to you yesterday. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out who's put us on old music. You know, <laughs> I was say we didn't all get put on hold, did we? Uh, somebody in the Florida Keys, whoever that was. All right. <laughs> see, you might want to pause it because there's a slight delay on screen switch. So this video, while there's no talking um, and there's just a few sounds behind it, was really impactful. Um, I actually got a, a question and a comment from the Surgeon General that said, when did we start posting these? That was really impactful. Um, and that was sent down through all of my supervisors. Um, so he saw it one of the first days it launched. Um, it just goes to remind you that, um, let's go back one. Um, it just goes to remind you that when you're out around the water, that somebody needs to be paying attention to the water and those that are in the water at all time. times. So that way, if something happens to one of the kids, you can immediately respond. Um, I got a few comments on social media about um, why wasn't somebody watching that child. Um, that video was shot with one of the um, water safety advocates down in Broward County. It was her son. He's a swimmer. Um, there was a cameraman in the water and there was an adult behind the cameraman watching the kids while the adults were acting on the um, deck. So <laughs> I had to explain that no child was harmed during the making of this um, short clip. But it is super impactful because all you see at the end is the child going down and the bubbles coming up and nothing happening. Um, and then social media, um, how many, I, and, I, and you can answer whenever you want, but how many of you all realize that in order to reach people, you have to, at, at least this point in time, 
have to be on social media, have to have a digital presence in order to make an impact and get people involved. Um, and many of the organizations that are um, working on water safety and drowning prevention, uh, like the Suncoast Kids, uh, Safe Kids Suncoast Coalition and Water Smart Broward, they started doing a massive push on social media and reaching out to the actual media and press and asking them to take a look at what was going on. Um, the press became aware of what was going on in April and started asking for interviews from certain um, coalitions throughout the state, um, along with Safe Kids Worldwide, which they then contacted me asking me for all of the data that I have just now shared with you all. Um, in June and July, many public pools started opening again, beaches started reopening, um, more supervision when it seems like, and, and I've been watching this every time I've gone out to the beach lately, is parents are more attentive to their children when they're at the beach as opposed to when they're at the pool, and especially when they're not in their home environment. Um, however, when the beaches and pools then reopen, there all become other potential um, aquatic related injuries that can happen. Okay, so um, some of the prevention activities that have taken place throughout the state, um, the TV, radio, social media campaigns that aired in May and June. Um, we have created uh, with WaterSmart Florida and all the agencies involved there, a uh, unified message um, of adult supervision, barriers, and emergency preparedness with many other subtopics to include watching for distractions, um, knowing how to protect your pool, learning CPR and how to swim, and learning how to swim is not just for kids, it's also for adults. And then proper life jacket usage. Um, my part of what I am working on is building out the coalitions and the connections for WaterSmart and um, Safe Kids Florida. We will move to um, the WaterSmart slide number 19. So WaterSmart Florida um, includes 114 partners in 22 counties. Uh, I, like I said, I'm trying to build the reach out. Um, many of you that are on this call are probably involved in some aspect or another in your county. Um, the Department of Health, the County Department of Health, of Health, the YMCAs, the Safe Kids Coalition, swim schools, hospitals, counties and city governments, nonprofits, schools and universities, law enforcement, and pool safety product companies are a big majority. And as you see on the map, on 18, on 19, sorry, um, there is, majority of it is in the southern part of the state. I am working on the panhandle. Believe me, I am working on it. <laughs> and then if you go to the next page, um, the Safe Kids Coalition, there are 15 of those that cover 40 counties, and they are always continuously working on drowning prevention whether it's in the summer or whether it's in the winter. It is a constant for them that they are working on this. And if you are involved with one of the coalitions, um, greatly appreciate it. And they, I know they greatly appreciate you helping them. So some of the activities that they've done in the last year, at least in 2019, um, were prevention, symposiums, lots of community engagement. Uh, they run school programming and they're starting to work on digital school programming right now so that they can continue that reach into the community. Um, many have been on radio shows, hosted podcasts, um, created swim lessons, um, availability. There were over 60 events held by five different coalitions in 2019 that reached over 7,000 people. Um, and that is just five of them. I don't always get all the numbers from all of my coalitions, but um, that was the vast majority of everything that happened last year. Um, and as you see, they don't just work on uh, water safety. They work on all of the safety topics for kids. So occupant safety, poison prevention, fire prevention, and heat safety. Next slide, please. 
So here's the update on the Pool Safely grant. Um, in 2018, the Department of Health received the grant from the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and it was written so that um, we were to help educate enforcement and um, uh, enforcement personnel and um, inspectors on the Virginia Graham Baker Act. In 2019, July 2019 is when I started. <laughs> I started in two, uh, April. Um, I began doing trainings in July, and my last one was done in Oakland County for the Panhandle um, on February 28th, right before everything shut down. Um, at current count, there are over 340 inspectors and enforcement staff that have been trained. Uh, the target number is 525. Many of these admins that are on this call, I will be reaching out to um, work on getting digital training um, for the next month and a half. Done that needs to do training, and then the other target was uh, at least one person in each of the top 10 counties with the highest grounding rate. I have I think seven down, and I have three to go. Um, and I will let those know that those counties know that who they are um, in an email here shortly. And then, <laughs> and then the other part was to educate the community on drowning prevention. Um, DOA has focused on water safety and prevention, and then uh, okay, blue pool, and the residential pool safety. I have been working with our sister coalitions to reach pool cleaning companies. Our I'm actually I'm here to know if I were going to ask for some excuse to look at some. Just a second. Take an action. Take an action. Take an action. Take an action. You put your phone on mute, whoever that is. Blue Jay bar, pull out. Blue Jay, I can ask you. I mean, switch call out. Or you can have a little time in the table. Make sure what's up. Amanda, you're unmuted now. Awesome. Thanks for that. <laughs> so we're working on getting the um, residential pool safety out through uh, the safety coalitions and through the Florida Swimming Pool Association and all the swimming pool companies and organizations uh, that are around the state just because they have a bigger reach into homes and can leave information with uh, residents. So if you'll switch to the la uh, next slide, please. So just to recap, um, 2020 trends appeared that they were climbing at the beginning of the year. Um, 2019, we didn't have any drowning incidents for children in February, March, and this year we did. Um, the pandemic-related March shutdown seemed to in equal an increase in drowning rates. Um, more distraction, less supervision, more work from home, children having access or the ability to get away and out of the house, um, and more portable and kiddie pool sales um, as they increased, it seemed like the numbers were also increasing. Uh, I have been told by several people around the state that you could not find a kiddie pool to buy by the end of March. Um, and, and they've also said that with some of the kiddie pools, water watcher tags are now being um, sold in the box. Um, I'm sure some people are just looking at it and tossing it aside, however, Hopefully it triggers a, hey, I need to be watching my children when I'm when they're in this water. Uh, at the end of the second quarter, the rates did begin to drop. Uh, we did increase the amount of attention from PSAs. Uh, the beaches and pools did reopen. Uh, coalitions and agencies began to use um, virtual trainings and reaching out into the community that way to build efforts 
in making sure that people understood that there was an issue going on. Um, and then just remember that if you're going out into open water, so please take safety precautions. Um, make sure you understand the, the dangers that come along with being out in open water and on a boat. Next slide, please. And my challenge to all of you is that if you don't currently or aren't currently doing anything in your communities, which I know majority of you probably are, but what is it that you do to help your community to be water safe and help the drowning prevention efforts throughout the state? All right, Amanda, thank you very much for presenting. We really appreciate that. Uh, our next speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Melvin Kramer. Uh, Dr. Kramer is an environmental and infectious disease epidemiologist with 40 years of professional experience in all aspects of infectious diseases, especially with and for the food industry, both as a regulator and as a consultant. He has consulted widely with food processors, manufacturers, growers, importers, exporters, and the cruise industry as well as having served as an expert in matters relating to the regulation of food and as an expert witness in litigation mostly in areas of foodborne disease outbreaks and recalls. He is the author of journal publications on food safety and infectious disease topics and has lectured at colleges, universities, and conferences, as well as internationally represented the United States on matters of BSE, uh, mad cow disease, primarily in Asia, where our beef was not being accepted, uh, as well as lectured on other topics, such as bloodborne disease, as well as respiratory disease, such as avian influenza and COVID-19. During the pandemic, Dr. Kramer has consulted with numerous businesses, industries, and educational institutions on appropriate protocols, PPEs, getting ready to open, as well as lecturing to industry groups. He has been appointed to be an expert on infectious disease epidemiology uh, and COVID-19 by the United States District Court for the Eastern District of New York. Dr. Kramer is also a FIHA member, FIHA director, and an REHS, both in Florida and nationally through NEHA. He has been a NEHA member since 1974. Uh, Dr. Kramer, thank you very much for being here today. I'm going to unmute you right now. All right, and you should be unmuted now, Dr. Kramer. Good morning. Uh, you're going to be um, sharing the uh, slide presentation, correct? From yep. your computer? Great. Yep. Okay. Can everyone see the first slide? Well, they can't talk, but I can see okay. it. Okay, <laughs> but you can see it. Okay, good. Okay, um, what I'd like to talk about is COVID-19, both the virology of it uh, and virology in, in general, as well as the issue of filters. Um, I specifically want to discuss HEPA filters, but more specifically, I want everyone to understand that we're getting filters uh, infused into recommendations as well as um, how to open certain businesses, including um, gymnasiums, spas, et cetera. The best guidance that we seem to be getting is uh, from New York State. So uh, I'd like to go through all of that with you. Next slide, please. Most of you have a background in, um, uh, in, in microbiology, virology. Um, I don't know if you can all read it. On my side, the FIHA logo is covering some of the um, uh, text on, on the second slide. But anyway, as you know, viruses are very small uh, infectious agents, they are, by definition, intracellular parasites. Therefore, they can only reproduce in living cells. The successful virus does not kill the host cell. Because if they do, then they die off. So the job of the virus is to propagate itself. And that's a very important piece to understand. Viruses infect all sorts of living matter, plants, 
as well as animal cells, bacterial cells, um, as we know from various disease entities, white cells, um, T cells, et cetera. They basically, they don't divide, but basically inside the host cell, there is a tremendous amount of activity that will go over. They are spread by bodily fluids in many cases, water droplets, blood sucking insects like mosquitoes. So when you think of, of those, those things, you can look at HPV for bodily fluids. You can uh, look at uh, from sneezing, uh, all the respiratory viruses, coronaviruses, um, and other, other uh, uh, viruses that uh, are common as well as more uh, bizarre, as well as things like we in Florida have dealt with like Zika, uh, Dengue, and um, all of those are in the uh, flaviviral uh, uh, family of, 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 of viruses. Next slide. How do they reproduce? Well, firstly, this word attachment is very important because if they don't have a place in the host cell to actually attach, they're not going to be able to infect the cells and they're not going to be able to reproduce. And they are very much specific to both a host and the virus. Now, when you look at the um, coronavirus, and uh, you've seen the picture, and I'm going to go over that in a little while, the binding site uh, is very, very important just in terms of not only how we transmit this disease, but more importantly, going forward, how are we going to get effective therapeutics, and ultimately an effective vaccine. So keep that in mind. And the best way that we can do that, one of the best ways, is to interrupt these binding sites where the virus actually attaches to the human cell and parasitizes it. Next slide. So when you look at in the infection uh, of a host cell, uh, the extracellular, that's outside the cell, say, is called a viron. Uh, it does have a protein coat that surrounds the nucleic acid. This uh, specific virus is an RNA virus, um, and uh, the outermost layers gives some protection to the virus, and it also is, has a little honing device in it, basically, uh, to find this receptor to find the place to bind uh, and infect the host cell. The intracellular state, this capsid, is removed, and the virus exists only as the nucleic acid or the RNA. Next slide. Infecting the host cell is very, very important. There's direct penetration of the naked virus where the genome, and that's a very important word, we look at what the viral genome is. We're very much into genomics right now. Uh, whether you're looking at a salmonella outbreak we want to look at it. We used to look at PFGE. Now we're looking at whole genomic sequencing. Well, we're looking at genomic sequencing here, not only from the um, uh, potential for a vaccine, but also to look at wobbling of the virus in terms of mutation. And also, uh, as I'm sure you've uh, been following, the Wuhan strain, which seems to have affected 
more of the Western United States versus a form that came probably from Italy or another European country, which was somewhat of a mutation of the Wuhan uh, virus. Let's be perfectly clear. Coronaviruses have been around for an extremely long period of time. And in all probability, most all of us have been infected with several coronaviruses because they are the cause of many of what we call the common cold. When you get into the actual virology of how you infect the host cell, it is very specific, very choreographed, and it has to be done just right or else there'll be failure. But they also are extremely successful. Next slide. This is a very good schematic uh, courtesy of uh, a uh, genetic company that uh, has mapped out the way, and if you follow the numbers, the attachment of the SARS-CoV-2, which we're looking at uh, COVID-19, um, into the host cell. Again, you look at this binding site, gets into the host cell, it then releases the viral RNA. You're then going to have replication of the viral components and the new viron, virons from the viral RNA. And then they will be released as new viral particles without, in this case, as you see, lysing or cutting the cell. So the cell is not killed, it just keeps on, on, on having this, this cycle. Next slide. What happens when the new viruses exit the host cell? Well, like everything else, when they go and uh, are released, they're looking for another cell to continue with the life cycle of this virus. And as they say, it keeps on giving. Now, that's the basic virology uh, that, you know, uh, one can certainly take an entire semester course of virology to get into all of the um, biochemistry, pathophysiology uh, of, 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 of virology. But I guess we covered that in about 10 minutes. Michael, I'm on uh, slide number 12, and this is coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2. And this is a very interesting uh, virus. The word corona means crown, and these um, spike proteins. Um, now, Michael, if you hit the next, hit next, we're going to have a, um, a uh, arrow to the red uh, spike proteins. It is believed that this is where we're going to have the best chance of a meaningful vaccine. Next, the gray is the uh, envelope which coats the virus. The yellow, and you can see how small these yellow pieces are. Michael, next two, please. Uh, is the envelope protein. And then lastly, the orange is the membrane protein. Basically, what you have in a virus is, 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 is protein and RNA. That's all, that's all a virus is. Coronavirus, next slide. Coronavirus, or SARS-CoV-2, or 
COVID-19, it's the same family as SARS, which was severe acute respiratory syndrome, uh, as well as MERS, which is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. The um, reservoir of SARS and MERS are somewhat different than what seems to be going on with um, uh, coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. We know that these are all zoonotic diseases, and MERS in the Middle East seems to have a camel as some type of intermediate host or reservoir. The um, SARS-CoV-2 had a bat as the uh, responsible uh, reservoir. And clearly, these uh, animals are not affected by, uh, by, by, by the virus. One can use the word when they go from species to species that we have breached into an environment which is unnatural. So in other words, if we left bats alone, we wouldn't have problems. Maybe the bats were in these, um, in these markets and somehow it jumped uh, from species to humans. They're about 125 nanometers in diameter. And as stated, they first were uh, uh, identified in uh, Wuhan, China. Next slide. As of uh, Wednesday evening, when I prepared this um, presentation, there are 22 million, almost 22 and a third mil uh, cases of COVID-19, with almost three quarters, over three quarters of a million deaths. In the United States, we have 5.5 million cases and 172,000 deaths, which is unthinkable. It's transmitted by droplet and aerosol transmission. All age groups seem to be susceptible. It can survive in the air as an aerosol for one to four hours and can survive on hard surfaces up to three days when we say under ideal circumstances, obviously, if you have a disinfectant, it's not ideal. These are some of the facts as to why we look at some of the mitigation strategies like social distancing, like hand hygiene and sanitizer, as well as mass utilization. Now, Let's get into the HEPA filters. HEPA filters uh, basically have a, um, a, a very, very good track record, and they are actually regulated by the United States Department of Energy. HEPA stands for High Efficiency Particulate Air. So we're filtering the air in a very high efficiency to get these small particles. Now, I don't want to confuse you, but some of the new regulations, requirements, recommendations calls for another type of filter, which is far less um, uh, effective and they are called MERV, M-E-R-V, which are minimum efficiency uh, reporting value. And these filters have to catch 90% of particles in the three to 10 micron range, 90% of the particles in the one to three micron range, and 50% of the particles in the 0.03 to one micron range. And this is becoming a cheaper standard 
uh, much less effective than HEPA filters. And for some reason, New York has put this in a requirement for gyms to open under their phase four um, protocol. So when people say, oh, we've replaced our filters and we're now much better than we were, you've got to think of the size that we're looking at. HEPA filters of medical grade capture at least 99.97% of these larger particles of greater than 0.3 microns. Uh, and one micron equals one um, uh, hmm, UM uh, to meet the standard set forth uh, with, with this. So what we're, we're really looking at is these are very, very small particles. Now, it is true that the probability of having one virus flowing through the air is very, very unlikely, but clearly not impossible. A filter eff efficacy refers to how many particles are trapped and removed from the airflow passing through the filter. So we're, when you look at dust and pollen and pet hair and dander and mold spores and dust mites, they're huge in comparison to a virus. Although the transmission of COVID-19 occurs mainly through droplet infection during close proximity to people, recent studies show that the aerosolization of the virus can hold in the air for several hours. Most studies found detecting airborne droplets of COVID-19 in the air is rare, but detecting it directly near a patient in an enclosed space like a restroom is more likely. Now, let me have another comment about restrooms. Toilets, and we do know that COVID-19 can be in fecal material, especially commercial toilets, have the ability to aerosolize. We know this and we've seen it very effectively with norovirus. So, when we look at, at hygiene and building cleanliness and how are we cleaning surfaces and how often we're cleaning bathrooms and toilets and all of these things, we have to keep in mind that things that don't seem to aerosolize actually can aerosolize. The Submicron region is about 0.25 to 1 micron. And the supermicron region has a diameter of larger than 2.5 microns. That's why the hospital grade HEPA filters are now being deployed and you're going to see them being advertised. The, the um, airline industry has had HEPA filters and are upgrading them. You're going to see the cruise industry going into HEPA filters. And I believe you're going to see office buildings going into them as well, because part of the psychology of returning to work is safety. And I think these minimum efficiency uh, reporting value filters, um, I don't know why they put them in, probably for cost containment, um, is, is, is something that's going to be problematic uh, for, for industries. Uh, and people who put in the HEPA filters may end up having, I'm going to use the word competitive advantage, uh, in the marketplace. So how effective are they? Well, their efficacy is 95% for aerosols, 
between 0.25 and 1 micron, and about 100% for anything larger than 2.5 microns. So to ensure particles of the size of COVID-19 are filtered out, a medical grade HEPA filter is definitely required. And that's why these minimum efficiency reporting values filter, even though the 13 are, um, are um, um, uh, just not going to make it. They're just not going to make it. HEPA filters are not that expensive. And they actually, you know, um, they're, they're very readily available. And they can be uh, used as a supplement to indoor transmission uh, as an option. Patients who are quarantined at home using air purifiers can also reduce exposure to people in the same household uh, by putting these um, pretty mobile air purifiers in with HEPA filters. And oh, by the way, vacuum cleaners have HEPA filters. Many of them do, because why would you want to vacuum something out and then have it shot out the back without, um, without a filter? But just like every filter, it has a useful life, and it also needs to be um, changed uh, on a routine basis. So I'm trying to respect the time Michael gave, and I think I have. I'm happy to uh, entertain any, any uh, questions, and I thank you for your patience. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Kramer. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can post them in uh, the chat video or the chat box. Yeah, I don't see anything coming across. You can always email the questions uh, to info at fiha.org, and we will get an answer to you uh, from our presenters. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, both of you, uh, Dr. Kramer and Amanda, uh, for coming and participating today and speaking at our uh, member meeting. Uh, so, oh, actually, we do have a question. Uh, what is the recommended frequency uh, to change the HEPA filters? Great question. I think what you're going to have to look at is you're going to have to look at the uh, instruction on the individual one. Not all of the HEPA filters are created equal. Uh, just like your home filters, which clearly aren't HEPA filters, most of them, um, some say this is a 30-day filter. Some say it is a 90-day filter uh, in a facility. I would be very, very conservative, and um, I would change them pretty frequently. Obviously, healthcare facilities have a, uh, a, a, a regimen, uh, and they're quite used to it. As I said, this is not new technology. Somebody has a question you mentioned about the bathrooms. Is there an issue with hand drying machines and COVID? I haven't seen any studies. I personally don't like hand drying machines. I'd much rather have uh, paper. I know it's not very green, but think of what you're doing. Um, you're potentially aerosolizing, and you're also potentially pushing it into people's um, mucous membranes, whether it's their eyes, their nose, et cetera. I don't like them. I have never liked them. And there have been some studies on other um, pathogens that uh, they're not the best. And also, as long as we're talking about bathrooms, CDC does have, for the Vessel Sanitation Inspection Program, uh, a, um, a uh, requirement that um, at the door that they have some type of paper to open the door, I like doors that open um, electronically. 
because let's face it, any paper that you have is porous and anything can go in to it, unless after using that, you're going to use hand sanitizer. Have there been any studies on if the COVID-19 or any other diseases can live on the HEPA filters? Or are there any special disposal methods that you have to use uh, if these HEPA filters are in damper areas like we're in Florida? Uh, could the virus live longer? I don't think, I, I, I don't think so, because remember, a virus by definition is an intracellular parasite. You're going to actually have to have the correct uh, host for it to, um, for it to uh, uh, propagate. And, um, you know, some of the uh, clients that we're dealing with actually are using HEPA filters and they're looking to put either UV uh, inside the air handlers as a secondary um, uh, way to disinfect. I do have Our hospitals have not had any real uh, documented uh, increase in nosocomial respiratory diseases uh, with using HEPA filters, which has been the uh, standard of care for a very long time. I do have one member who wants to be unmuted to ask questions. I'm just trying to get him. Oh. But he's going to have to message his questions later because I think his phone is muted. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Kramer. Uh, we do appreciate you uh, hopping on our call today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Hope people learn something. And both of these presentations will be available on the FIHA website. Uh, give us a couple days, so sometime late next week. All of them will be edited uh, and available uh, for viewing on the FIHA website and on the FIHA uh, YouTube channel as well. Uh, for those of you that do want a certificate, um, please uh, email me and let me know that you attended the class and I will get your certificate. Um, for those of you that actually typed your name uh, into the participant box, I've been uh, signing you into the event. Um, for those of you that did not, um, please email me so I know uh, those of you that, uh, that did not have their name showing up uh, on the participant list and I will make sure we get you your certificate out. Uh, so that concludes our education session. Uh, we're going to have our uh, 2020 member meeting now. Uh, it's per the FIHA bylaws uh, once a year. We have, to have the member meeting and also our board meeting. Uh, so those of you that don't wish to stay for the member and the board meeting, uh, or if you just want to stay for the member meeting, that's fine. If you don't want to stay for either one of those, you can log off right now. There's going to be a, a couple of beeps and clicks. All right, so I'll assume the rest of you guys that are on the call want to stay for the member meeting. Oh, we'll give it like two seconds. All right, so welcome to the uh, member section of our meeting. So what you all have been waiting for, the results of our 2020 uh, Board of Directors elections. Uh, so we put out a virtual call for nominations, and then from there we put out uh, virtual election results, uh, election polling. Uh, you were able to vote on the FIHA website. We had it open for uh, over a week for people to log on and vote. Uh, we did have a decent number of members uh, log on and, and vote for everybody. So here is your results uh, for president-elect. Our new president-elect is Ed Bettinger. Congratulations, Ed. Our new first VP is Gary Frank. Congratulations, Gary. 
Our second VP is Judah Tolbert. Our treasurer is Stephanie Witherspoon. And we have two directors, uh, Dr. Kramer, who you just heard from, and Greg Crumpton. So thank you all uh, for voting in the elections. Thank you all for voting in elections. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, all active members are encouraged and allowed to uh, vote in any uh, FIHA elections or any other FIHA votes that we have. So we're going to give you a little bit um, of information about our members. Uh, currently, we have 451 uh, total members. Uh, out of those, 322 are active members. We have some journal-only members. We have 11 life members. We have some non-FIHA RS members at 47. We have 27 retired members, 30 student memberships, and nine sustaining members. So we have some membership goals for 2020 to 2021. Uh, one of the goals is to increase new memberships and renewals. Uh, we need to develop new and innovative ways to hold district meetings and activities. Uh, since COVID uh, came about, uh, we can't gather in really large groups, but we still need to have our district meetings and ways for us to engage uh, that are off the computer. Uh, so we're looking for some new and innovative ways uh, to hold our district meetings and activities. Uh, we want to increase our member engagement district meetings uh, with our journal, with webinars, and with other activities. And we're going to uh, continue working on developing a strong presence in colleges and universities as well. So some of you might have noticed that when you tried to renew your memberships, um, the system did an update and was having some problems. Uh, if you didn't pay your membership, say, in 2019, and then you tried to pay your membership in 2020, it's actually giving you duplicate memberships, duplicate invoices. Uh, so to do away with all of that and to do away with uh, a lot of the problems we were having with invoicing, uh, we went on and made sure that everybody was paid up to date for their trainings. But as far as the membership goes, we voided out all of the uh, old expired invoices that were over a year old. Uh, now uh, you need to pay your memberships within 30 days of the invoice that you receive of when your membership ends. So, for instance, uh, if your membership ends August 1st, you have until September 1st to pay your membership. Uh, after 30 days, uh, your membership goes to a suspended status. Uh, suspended members are not active members of FIHA. Um, it is kind of like an inactive member, except the system is going to show you as being suspended. Uh, to change from a suspended member status uh, to an active member, you need to go to the FIHA website and you need to uh, log in and pay for a new membership uh, using the same email address that you used for your old FIHA membership. Um, doing that will take it out of, uh, at a suspended member status and all of your data from years past will show up again uh, as soon as you reactivate your membership. So you won't lose any data, you won't lose your RS tracking, we won't lose any of your old invoices, everything will still be there um, except that you're going to now be an active member and you won't have any uh, old invoices that you need to pay. So all of your information will be restored uh, as far back as the, uh, the server went when we updated the website a couple of years ago. So uh, FIHA needs you to uh, renew your memberships. Uh, so like I said, if you haven't had, uh, if your membership has expired and it's over 30 days old, um, and if you're in suspended member status, please log on and renew your membership. Uh, invite a friend to join FIHA. Uh, FIHA has a really great uh, promotion going on that we've been doing for a couple of years now where we give you a free one-year membership uh, for anybody who's not been a FIHA member before. So we do have cards going around the various health departments uh, that you're allowed to give them out to everybody, and all you have to do is scan and email them back to me. Uh, or you can just email me and say, hey, I have this new member. Uh, I just need their name, their phone number, and their email address and I will get them a free membership and they'll start getting all the emails from us uh, and then they'll have their membership for a year. Uh, after the year is up, if they decide to continue the membership, they just pay their invoice. And if they decide not to con continue their membership, uh, after 30 days, it'll go into suspended status. Uh, and then they don't have to pay, if they don't wanna be a member, they don't have to pay for it. We don't stick you in collections or anything. It's just a, 
a free one-year membership to see how you like FIHA. Uh, we're going to be doing more uh, webinars uh, since we're not going to be able to see everybody in person so much. Uh, FIHA has been trying to jump on the bandwagon of, of doing all of our virtual trainings and webinars, and we always need guest speakers for it. Uh, so I know a lot of people still need to present and have interesting topics they want to talk about. So please email me at info at fiha.org uh, if you're interested in being a guest speaker for one of our webinars. We have our Journal of Environmental Health uh, that we're going to aim to put out um, by the end of this year, early next year. Uh, so we need journal articles and journal advertisers for that. Uh, if you're interested in writing a journal article, send me an email. Uh, and we'll see about getting your journal article published for you after it's peer reviewed. Uh, if you're interested in working on the journal, if you have an interesting uh, interest in publishing anything or in trying to help us get advertisers uh, or just working with us uh, on the journal in general, uh, again, please send that to me. Uh, send me all your information and we'll get you on the journal committee. Uh, FIHA has 13 different districts around Florida, so make sure you get involved with your FIHA district. Uh, you'll see uh, different emails going out. Uh, we send all the emails out to all of our members and contacts whenever we have district meetings. You don't have to be a member of that district to go to the district meeting. Anybody uh, is welcome to attend. Uh, so keep an eye out for all of those emails about the district activities. Uh, we're also going to be developing uh, various other online trainings this year. Uh, we have some OSTS trainings we're going to try and do. Uh, we're also going to try and do some of the Boy Scout merit badges uh, that went over really well uh, at the conference last year. And they've been doing a lot of virtual training this year. So if you're interested in helping us teach and be a merit badge counselor for some of the Boy Scout badges, um, hit me up with that as well, uh, and we'll get you involved with that. That concludes what I have for the member meeting. I'm going to unmute. So does anybody have any comments? Any members have any comments of different activities that you'd like to see for the year or to see FIHA do this year? Uh, Michael, this is John Benson. I have an artist on the board up here to get a lot of background noise. Um, <laughs> I'm All right, Bob, go right ahead. So you can hear me now. Yes. Oh, excellent. Um, so I just wanted to bring everybody up to speed on uh, what the uh, RS board has done, and uh, uh, I thought that would be uh, helpful for today's uh, event. Um, <clears throat> uh, we have 140 active RSs or RH, uh, REHSs or REHPs in, in Florida. Uh, currently, uh, uh, about 13 emer emeritus RSs. And uh, last year was a very busy year for the board and, and for uh, you, you folks out there. We had uh, 17 new RSs take the exam and pass uh, in 2019. So far this year, uh, with, with COVID and other issues, uh, we've had one pass, so uh, 18 in, in this two-year window. Uh, we had seven that didn't pass during that uh, same period. They attempted the test and, and didn't pass. But we have seen that uh, it looks like the uh, courses that we are offering uh, are pretty good uh, for those that have taken them. They've uh, uh, a majority of folks have passed, and all of the powerpoints we've used in those live presentations are posted on the FIHA website now. Um, there was a big rush, of course, at the end of 19 to take the exam because the uh, contract with NEHA for the RS exam changed significantly. And in fact, um, they went to co full uh, computer-based testing and we've got the uh, 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 price now set uh, uh, where we basically break even. Uh, it's $320 for a member of FIHA and $370 for a non-member. 
uh, NEHA charges uh, 390 for a member of NEHA and 575 for a non-member. So it's a little bit cheaper. And then, uh, of course, uh, they offer more services than we do because we're all volunteers here. Um, in 2019-2020, the there were four uh, RSs passed that are designated in training. They all have the uh, uh, educational requirements, but not the two years experience in environmental health. So this is a NEHA RS designation uh, that has been adopted by FEHA. And uh, unfortunately, this status does not satisfy the DOH uh, certified environmental health professional requirements. So uh, you'll still need to sustain that, maintain that until uh, you get your two years in. Um, the uh, RS board donated $1,000 last year uh, for the AEM in Howie in the Hills and 500 this year uh, for the scholarship fund. And um, I just want to remind you all, uh, uh, we've got the uh, biennial uh, at the end of this year for your uh, registration renewal. We need uh, you to log in the 30 contact hours that you've completed by uh, um, New Year's Eve uh, this year. 12-31-2020, and post those uh, um, within a few days or a couple of weeks of the end of the month uh, in the electronic FIHA website. We pull all that together by about uh, February 1, and then we reissue those certifications by March 1 uh, for next year. That's all I have. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Bob. Um, we have uh, one question come across, um, how does the computer-based test compare to the paper-based test? Oh, it's an identical test. Um, it's simply uh, done by computer. Um, it is the same exam. Uh, NIHA and FIHA have uh, the breakouts on the types of questions and uh, uh, some example questions, of course, are available. Um, the, the advantage is you can find out your score immediately upon taking the exam. Um, and they have not set up uh, virtual. Uh, you have to go to a computer-based testing site. Um, and, but there's quite a few of those Pearson View sites all over the state. Uh, we did get some uh, emails recently about how you're tracking the RS hours. Can you tell us when the last update uh, you did for the um, the contact hours was, and some people are seeing some that are in parentheses that says pending a certain amount of hours. Can you explain that a little bit more? Sure. Um, it's been about six weeks, I think, since I posted that. Uh, on the RS Corner tab on the FIHA webpage, I've written the date there when I last posted those. Uh, we use the uh, JOT form um, uh, accumulator uh, database and, and all of that information is available to us by uh, going and downloading it. But it takes some time to look it through and manipulate it and make sure all the classes that are offered are are uh, acceptable. And uh, that's where uh, the pending uh, uh, parentheses might be on there for the uh, uh, amount of hours that have been submitted. Uh, we have some uh, classes that uh, look like they may or may not be uh, good for, for environmental health uh, credit. Uh, some of them we need to check with NEHA to see if they would give credit for those, and, and that, that information is uh, not available yet, but it will be. So looking on the FIHA website, it, it seems that June 6, 2020 was the last update. Does that seem about right to you? That sounds right. All right, All right so just to remind our members, if you put Anything in after June 6th, Bob will get to it. Um, there's a lot of members and it's a lot of work that he does. Uh, so thank you, Bob, for running the uh, RS board. Um, we do know that it, it is a, a real lot of work for you to do. Oh, sure. And uh, I want to thank the board members, uh, Chuck Henry, Tricia Dow, uh, Dean Bottiger, and Bart Harris, because they helped me quite a bit and uh, uh, guide us uh, down this path of um, getting everybody a certified that wants to be, and then um, uh, help with the contact hours as well. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, so this concludes the portion of our uh, member meeting. If anybody else has any questions, we can, uh, you can type them in the chat window right now.
I don't want to unmute everybody again because we might not be able to hear, but if you do have a question, uh, I can unmute you or I can read it off for you. I'll give it a minute to make sure. Uh, we could have somebody ask if there are any district meetings scheduled at this time right now. Uh, we don't have anything on the books this second, uh, but hopefully that will change in the next uh, week or two. So if you are uh, interested in hosting a district meeting, now it doesn't have to be something inside. It can be something as simple as, hey, we're going to go do a beach cleanup and we're going to have a barbecue at, you know, at the same time, or hey, we're going to go bowling, or uh, we can go on a hike, we can go on a trip. So there's a lot of different things we can do to maintain social distance to, and to maintain small group size and be outside at the same time uh, and still to have fun. So if you do have any uh, ideas, definitely shoot them over to me. Uh, or contact uh, your district chairperson. All right, so that concludes our member meeting. Uh, the next is going to be our uh, board meeting. Uh, any active members are welcome to stay for the board meeting if you would like. Uh, if you're not an active member of FIHA, if you can please sign off the call. Uh, and thank you for attending. Please be on the lookout for uh, any additional webinars. Um, remember to check all the emails that I send out. Uh, I always try to send out some interesting stuff and try not to spam you too much with uh, with information. Uh, so usually anything I send out for FIHA is always going to have some kind of informational value to it. 